We're now going to go to our first speaker, who is uh, Barbary from Australia. So Barbary um, is a late con convert to feminism and lesbianism, hit the ground running, part owner of Long Breast Press. Her broad interest reflected an in eight degrees, PhD cancelled at the last moment, and 36 years of activism on how political and medical decisions affect women's, lesbians' health, well-being and human rights. And the title of Barbara's talk is Lesbians in the Land of Oz, Australia. So welcome, Barbara, and over to you. An acknowledgement to the traditional elders of the Wurundjeri and why we're on tribes and their elders past and present on whose lands we live, or I live, some of us live on other Aboriginal lands, and to their elders past, present and emerging. And I'd like to also pay tribute to our lesbian feminist elders who have been fighting the good fight and whose um, baton coal has picked up in this talk. I will examine the historical Australian context of attacks on women's and more specifically lesbians' sex-based human rights, as discussed in our chapter of women's rights gender wrongs, and outline some of the later developments since COAL, the Coalition of Activist Lesbians Inc. Australia, submitted our chapter. We called it Exclusion by Inclusion, Circuses, Sappho, and Strange Bedfellows in Oz. Oz is our pet name for Australia, but on reflection, reference to the role of the wizard in the Wizard of Oz movie seems appropriate. In it, the country is um, governed by the, the thundering orders of someone who claims, I am Oz, the great and powerful. But when Toto pulls back the curtain, the wizard is revealed as a tiny, snivelling fraud. Cole's mission parallels Toto's, revealing gender identity ideology as a fraud. I remember being disgruntled when, in 2013, the words man and woman, thanks to Julia Gillard's government, were deleted from the Commonwealth Sex Discrimination Act. But only much later, reading Billick's and Kirkup's warnings of how big pharma billionaires were pushing puberty blockers and teaching trans ideologists how to get ahead of the law via Denton's handbook, did I truly, along with other members of Coal, begin to understand the extent of the worldwide threat to women's rights. In structuring this talk, I had decided to deal with past issues first and then move on to current and future challenges. But the issues raised in the New South Wales Equality in inverted commas bill are too urgent, so I've reversed the order. The New South Wales Equality Bill, New South Wales being one of the last um, states that doesn't have so much uh, self-ID and other woo-woo. Cole has joined with three other feminist groups to fight this despicable bill. Here are some of the recommendations. One, redefine sex and sexual orientation to entrench in law the fiction that there are more than two sexes. Result, Multiple made-up legal descriptions of sex, e.g. non-binary, which the Australian Bureau of Statistics had already stated was, quote, not of high enough quality to be used in analysing the 2021 census. But the Bureau is at it again, running consultations, not with any feminist groups that we know of, regarding the 2026 census wording. If there are multiple legal sexes with no factual bases, this will affect not only sex segregated services for women's safety and sport, but also the stability of long running Australian data collection series, which will affect countless um, policy decisions. 
two, minors can transition without parental knowledge or consent. Results, children under 16 can apply to transition based solely on the statement of the person who has provided counselling to them, who does not necessarily have to be an accredited child psychologist. The child can decide whether their parents are to be notified, decide on their own medical treatment with puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones, whether or not their parents agree, and transition even if one parent or carer doesn't consent. Um, just a note, um, Gillian Spencer, a senior psychiatrist at the Queensland Children's Hospital, was stood down for questioning puberty blockers. Other elements of the bill include removal of all offences regarding prostitution, removal of barriers to commercial surrogacy, which would facilitate coercion of women and treat children as commodities, criminalisation of outing anyone's gender history, women in prison with violent offenders, faith community women avoiding public spaces due to males being present, vulnerable women not being able to choose female health and other carers or strip searches, and women losing positions and earnings. We need to ask who benefits from this? The New South Wales men's government must be reminded that their proposed gender affirming legislation is not progressive. It is being driven by well-funded rainbow umbrella LGBTQ plus lobby groups who do not speak for the majority of people, people with an LGB sexual orientation. They speak for a TQ plus men's rights movement that seeks to impose their own rights over those of women, lesbians and others. We have heard, luckily in the past few days, that the state government is postponing a vote on the proposed act, which might give us a bit more time to militate, although um, the New South Wales women in coal have been extremely active. Next issue, the Australian Human Rights Commission, AHRC, and the Lesbian Action Group. Some coal members include, are also members of the newly formed grassroots lesbian organisation, Lesbian Action Group, or LAG. LAG recently applied to the Victorian Pride Centre to hold a lesbians-born female-only event to celebrate International Lesbian Day, which was rejected. So LAG applied to the AHRC for an exemption to the Commonwealth Sex Discrimination Act to allow them to meet. This application was also rejected by the Australian Human Rights Commission on the basis of these rejections, which were framed as being discriminatory against other members of the LGBTIQA++++ community, LAG has gained an unprecedented amount of media exposure in mainstream press, TV and social media, even addressing parliament, compared to the usual blackout on gender-critical feminist views. There is lag demonstrating outside the Pride Centre. Lag has decided to appeal the Commission's decision. In its notice of decision in the lag case, the Commission has decided not to grant the temporary exemption sought by the Lesbian Action Group. It is instructive to follow the Commission's reasoning, uh, reasoning in inverted commas, in uh, reaching this decision, I, I can do no better than quote its own words. 4.2. This de decision involves consideration of the term sex as a legal concept in the Sex Discrimination Act. The Commission notes that the word sex is not defined in the SDA, and of course the words woman and man were taken out. 
The amending act introduced protections on the ground of sexual orientation, gender identity, and intersex status, and replaced references in the SDA to opposite sex with different sex. The explanation given for this in the explanatory memorandum for the amending act was that sex is not a binary concept. Importantly, for present purposes, the provisions of the SDA, SDA also suggest that a person's sex can be changed. This interpretation is consistent with the way sex has been used as a legal concept throughout Australia, including legislation dealing with birth registers. That might be so, but Cole argues that this does not accord with scientific or biological reality, meaning that the SDA, as amended from 2013 onwards, has not been fit for, for purpose nor fulfilled its brief of protecting women, women as a sex-based class. In the summary of the uh, AHRC's decision on the exemption application, the Commission acknowledges that lesbians in Australia have faced significant structural and entrenched discrimination, both historically and in the present day. The Commission agrees that it is important and beneficial for lesbians to gather as a community to celebrate their culture and discuss issues of special relevance to that, their community. So far, so good. The Commission notes that the SDA protects individuals from discrimination on the basis of both sexual orientation and gender identity. Transgender women as a group also face significant structural and entrenched discrimination. In their preliminary view, as Kara has noted on her substack, 7.41, the Commission is not persuaded it is appropriate and reasonable to make distinctions between women based on their cisgender or transgender experience or among same-sex attracted women based on the exclusivity of their same-sex attraction as at an event of this kind, or exclude same-sex attracted women who are transgender, bisexual and queer from the an, an event of this kind. And 7.42, the Commission notes that the great the grant of this exemption may lead to the further exclusion of and discrimination against same-sex attracted transgender women. Transgender women are a group who have and continue to experience discrimination, harassment and social exclusion. Same-sex attracted transgender women? Oh, you mean men? And these transgender women, i.e. men, are a group who have and continue to experience discrimination, harassment and social exclusion. Transgender women, i.e. men as a group, also face significant structural and, and entrenched discrimination. So the lesbians in Australia who the AHRC acknowledged a couple of minutes ago have faced significant structural and entrenched discrimination, both historically and in the present day. The Commission agrees that it is important and beneficial for lesbians to gather as a community to celebrate their culture, but we're going to have discrimination against our sexual discrimination, uh, sexual orientation thrown under the bus in preference of the rights of men who think they are oppressed women. <sighs> On to a couple of past and continuing challenges. In 1994, Cole gained official accreditation with the United Nations, being the first ever lesbian-specific organisation in the world to achieve this, then attended the Fourth World Conference on Women in Beijing in 95 as a non-government organisation, where we provided the first ever lesbian-only space in the UN in the form of a tent in order to caucus with lesbians from the rest of the world, aiming to get specific uh, lesbian-specific language included in the original Beijing platform for action. 
which was unfortunately removed at the last minute by a coalition of religious patriarchs. Some coal members also performed in the women's circus. One of coal's most important actions ever since then has been resisting male colonisation of language and gaslighting. We resist infiltration, political undermining and personal and legal attacks. Uh, uh, that reminds me of Portland on lesbian spaces and lives, which have often preceded broader assaults on women's sex-based rights. Cole believes that current federal and state legislation in Australia contravenes all of the women's declaration in um, international articles, plus at least seven UN documents on women's and children's human rights. Just a word about the famous Yogyakarta principles, which was the first quasi UN document to mention sexual orientation and gender identity rights. These were developed by an independent expert group in 2006. However, they have never, as some people would like us to believe, been adopted by the UN. And in fact, Professor, Professor Robert Wintermute, who took part in that group, later stated that they had totally failed to consider the effect of the principles on women's human rights, nor how fully intact men would invade women's spaces increasing their risk of harm by sexual harassment, assault and violence. He now completely repudiates the principles. The impact of, on, of gender identity ideology on lesbian lives and organising has been profoundly divisive, continuing today. For decades, lesbians have been driven underground when wishing to organise and such a retrograde return to secrecy since the halcyon days of the 70s to 90s when we were out and proud and had lesbian spaces for every day and night of the week it means that lesbians who want to come out now cannot access alternative narratives to mainstream lgbtq and ia plus dogma younger lesbians risk being trans simply for want of any other form of validation or socialisation through lesbian feminist analysis and interaction. Lawfare. Yeah, courts and tribunals have been used as blunt instruments by trans activists to challenge lesbians and other women's very basic human rights of freedom of thought, belief, speech and association. Um. Australian women rejoiced at a watershed moment for our rights when in 1984, the Commonwealth Sex Discrim Discrimination Act provided for special measures to advance women's substantive equality. But that didn't last long, forming the basis for future court actions that denied the rights of women born female, the SDA was changed in 2013 to protect sexual orientation, gender identity and intersex status. Definitions of woman, i.e. a member of the female sex irrespective of age and men were removed and gender was given the same status as sex with neither term being defined. Gender identity has a circular non-definition enabling self-ID but there's no guidance on reconciling competing gender-based and sex-based rights claims. Savo's party. Continuing our 15-year tradition of national lesbian gatherings, in 2006, Savo's party held a private lesbians-born female-only reunion. A trans-identified male, Tim, learn, learning of this, complained to the South Australian Equal Opportunity Commission. In the case hearing, he gave evidence of having no intention to attend if invited. So his only motivation seemed to be to stop us gathering. He wanted the tribunal to deny lesbians our freedom of association. Savo's party won the case, but had to raise $10,000 for legal costs, not in a time of uh, crowdfunding. 
Since that time, lesbian organisations have been unable to advertise events publicly if we wish to keep them lesbian only. July 2021 saw the Tasmanian Anti-Discrimination Commissioner Sarah Balk deny Jessica Hoyle of LGB Alliance Tasmania an exemption to exclude biological men from lesbian events. The Commissioner made the ludicrous suggestion that Hoyle might want to check inside attendees' underpants to see if they were really female. At the time of Cole writing its chapter, Hoyle was considering her extremely expensive legal options for an appeal. And then there was uh, Roxanne Tickle, who took Sal Grover to the Human Rights Commission for excluding biological maize, uh, males from the, her free women's and lesbians networking app Giggle in order to prevent death threats and toxic male behaviour. Seems very logical to me. Tickle demanded that Giggle management undergo education on sex and gender and gender identity and that all transgender people have full access to Giggle. But as Grover argued, I am educated on sex and gender. I just don't agree with their ideology. I'm never going to agree. It renders my company useless and takes away my own human rights of freedom of speech and association. Tickle initially decided to pursue the matter in federal court, then discontinued, and then decided to pursue it again. There's been a two-year campaign, as some of you may know, similar to that against Kathleen Stock in the UK by trans activists to oust Holly Lawford-Smith from Melbourne University, starting with protests about her website inviting women to speak on how their lives were affected by TRAs, rallies on campus, office invasion, and instigation of a second internal disciplinary process. The first one was unsuccessful regarding her attendance at Let Women Speak Melbourne. Her students too have been faced, have faced stickers saying, anyone who takes feminism is a fascist. And a hundred pages of her social media were examined by the disciplinary panel, after which the case was dismissed. The female university provost says that it has a resolute commitment to academic freedom, including expression of gender critical views. Holly disagrees. She was forbidden to speak about her disciplinary process and has now lodged a legal work safe complaint against the university for providing an unsafe workplace. In a direct parallel with Stonewall in the UK, ACON, the AIDS Council of New South Wales, um, administers the Australian Workplace Equality Index, which is a Ponzi scheme or something, charging megabucks to um, train corporates on how to be inclusive <clears throat> of their LGBT plus employees. They follow the Denton's handbook to the letter, acting much like a cult, where you are either a shining example, climbing the ladder of the Australian Workplace Equality Index, um, or you are shunned and demonised. Sadly, our um, national broadcaster, the ABC, is um, uh, well captured by this ideology. We have a strange contradiction regarding our mass media. Sometimes they've been shown allegedly to report direct lies, such as when a televised episode of the ABC's Australian story on 24th May 2021 showed Michelle Telfer, director of the Melbourne Gender Clinic at the Royal Children's Hospital, telling an 11-year-old client that if he stopped using puberty blockers after a year or two, his body would go quote, back to how it would have been. But on another occasion, it was shocking to hear that Redux had been ordered by the e-safety commissioner, no less, 
to delete a factual story about a biological male topping the goal scoring in female soccer in Oz because it might be, quote, illegal to report the facts of the case, unquote. But how can democracy function when government and government appointees dictate what is or is not to be published? Um, the AHRC has got itself into hot water with with um, threatened de-accreditation with a status in the Human Rights Committee uh, due to the previous government's um, appointment of mates to Human Rights Commissioner um, positions. Interestingly, the Australian Human Rights Commission regained its A status, the UN Human Rights Committee, just before it refused LAG's um, exemption to uh, meet. In conclusion, in Oz, the state is enforcing belief in gender ideology on the population with legal, professional and personal consequences for all, including lesbians, who refuse to believe.